Good morning, everyone. This, uh, this is the Integrated Management IPM, knowing what you need to look for. And this uh, webinar is uh, presented by Michelle Atkinson. Michelle is one of the agents in Manatee County Extension, and I will be helping her as well. My name is Nelly Nelson. What is Integrated Management IPM? All the common indoor and outdoor pest problems can be prevented by using Integrated Pest Management IPM. It's not just the application or the absence of pesticides. It is a problem solving process that is used to identify, manage and reduce the risk from pests. In this webinar, homeowners will be able to implement practices to control common household pests, recognize human behaviors that cause pest problems and how when to call a professional. These professionals will be helping you to control infestations related to public health, general rodents as you can see in the screen, and damaging the structure that can be damaged by the termites. And as you can see, those are the ones that we're going to be seeing. Michelle, do you want to continue? <laughs> Okay, Nellie. Yep, I've got it. So um, we have some objectives here and uh, we're hoping that today you will learn how to be able to prevent a lot of problems that can happen in the house. Um, we want you to be able to recognize what's really a problem and what may not be a problem. Um, Nellie, I'm going to ask if you'll just mute because when you make a sound, uh, the camera will go over to you. So if you'll just mute, then it won't go back and forth. Um, so we also want you to know when to recognize it's time to call in a professional. And um, I've got some personal experiences in that that I'm happy to share with you as well. You know, it can, it can happen to any of us. We can, any of us can have a pest problem. So in order for us to um, even have a pest problem, three things have to be present. So there needs to be some kind of a water source for the pest, a food source for the pest, and also harborage. They're, they need to have a place to hang out. Um, so if you have a pest problem, a great way to try to overcome that is to uh, reduce one of those one of those issues. We call it, you know, a triangle and or like three legs of a stool. Um, and if you cut off one of the corners or if you cut off one of the legs of the stool, then you can help eliminate that problem. So we look for ways to um, reduce water sources available to pests, reduce food sources available to pests, and of course reduce those harborage areas or places that they'll set up camp. So some of the most common complaints that we hear about um, indoors are ants like pharaoh ants. Now, um, we also have, in my area, I'm in, in Manatee County, which is just south of Tampa, we also have ghost ants that come in pretty regularly. Um, but these are those little small indoor ants, a lot of people refer to them as sugar ants. Um, they come in for various reasons. Sometimes we notice a big um, infestation indoors or, or they look for ways in when it's been raining heavily outside. Uh, they're their mounds or nests outside become inundated with water, so they're looking for a dry place to set up. Um, or sometimes when it's super, super dry outside, they're coming in looking for water. Um, so other reasons, they come in looking for food. And different times of year, um, they come for different things. Sometimes they're looking for sugar. Sometimes they're looking for protein. Um, it just depends on what's going on in the nest and what they need to feed the queen at the time. So if you think that 
just eliminating the you know sugary products um, and the availability to that will reduce these that's not necessarily true um, sometimes like grease on a stove or uh, butter in a toaster or something like that can actually attract them too because sometimes they're looking for like proteins and fats german cockroaches oh those are like the worst and I do have personal experience with these guys um, but we do hear about these especially in um, you know multi-family situations like apartments or condos um, where one person is treating but maybe the other folks that live there are not uh, one person's doing what they need to do but other folks may not be um, so they can be a real a real problem and my experience is my husband is an auctioneer and he sells um, like a restaurant equipment uh, out of like, and, and this is awful, but it's true, out of school districts, like the school boards, he'll sell the big mixers and ovens and things um, from the school districts. And he brought home a carving station um, for his little outdoor grill area. And somehow maybe on his shoes or something, one of the egg cases came into our house and we didn't know it. And the next thing we knew, we had a infestation of German cockroaches. Um, they're very difficult to treat unless you know what you're doing. Um, they're, we've got some good bait products now that are very effective, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but if, if you don't understand um, how to bait and monitor, then you're going to have a really difficult time getting rid of these guys. And then the one that makes everybody's spine shiver is bed bugs. <laughs> um, a lot of us, if, you, if you've had any experience with bed bugs, you know that they can be very challenging to control as well. You have to be very diligent in your clean out methods um, and making sure that you've gotten all the nooks and crannies taken care of. Um, but again, the best, best, best way to deal with these types of issues is really prevention. I guess that little guy came up. So that last little picture that came up um, is the bed bug and then next to it is a picture of like some sheets or linens that, uh, bed linens that have uh, bed bug evidence. So what I do when I go into a hotel, uh, because even the cleanest, nicest, friendliest hotels can have bed bugs. It's not them, it's the people that come in um, that can bring them in. And you may be traveling a lot and not know that you have them on your luggage and bring them in. So it's a real problem that hotels are constantly battling and looking for. But the way that I go in to check is um, I'll either leave my luggage outside with my family in the hall or I'll put it in the bathtub because there's not going to be bed bugs in the bathtub. They don't have that harborage, that place to hide. So um, you'll want to put your bath, your luggage in the bathtub. And then you go and you pull the linens off the bed, that nice neat bed that the, that the maids have, uh, or housekeeping has done for you, <laughs> you're gonna rip it apart. Um, and look in the corners and the crevices and the cording around the mattress. And you're gonna look for the, that dirty um, kind of look because they suck blood. So they excrete a very dark excretion. You'll see their little exoskeletons um, in those areas. So if you pull that, that linen back and you see anything that looks similar to this, I would go downstairs and talk to management. Um, you do not want this problem because it's, it is a challenge to get rid of. If you bring these home, um, there's some major treatment that has to be done to really get them out of your house. Okay, some other common pest problems that we have indoors are uh, fleas, ticks, um, pantry and fabric pests. Uh, so, you know, if you have animals, then fleas and ticks can be a real problem. Um, obviously, monitoring your pets is really important, um, to, you know, because that's the vector typically. They're bringing them into us, but once they come in, then they have us to feed on. So, um, we want to closely monitor our pets and, and us as well, you get little bites on your ankles and you're not sure what's going on. Um, 
you know, you may have fleas. So we'll talk about some ways to deal with that. Pantry and pest problems. Um, one of the best things to do is really eliminate the, the way that they get into the foods. Um, store your foods in containers. You know, keep your uh, flour, if you can't put it in a container other than the, you know, paper bag that it comes in, put it in the freezer or the refrigerator so the pests can't get into them. Uh, cereals are another one that can can be a real problem. Um, sometimes rice, um, you'll want to store those things in containers to help eliminate some of these problems. And then what do we hear about in the outdoors? Um, so ants, ants can be a real problem um, outside, fire ants especially, we have them all over Florida. They can really hurt and sting. So fire ants are a, a big one. Another one is crazy ants. So in the photos, you'll see the red ant um, up close. That's a fire ant. And then next to the sidewalk, that's a, a fire ant mound. But just underneath that is something more like a crazy ant mound. Um, crazy ants like to be out in like leaf litter or out in a woodsy or even landscaped area. So that's the picture of the, the woods there. That's where they'll create their, their nests. And so they're very difficult to track down these little crazy ants. Crazy ants, and my picture of a crazy ant didn't come up. There he is. Okay, so these crazy ants, they have really long antennae, super long antennae, and they're little, and they run around um, like crazy. That's why they got their name. A lot of ants will follow a trail or a line. Uh, crazy ants just kind of run here, there, and everywhere. Uh, so it's that's, again, how they got their name, Crazy Ants. It's just from running around with no rhyme or reason, it seems. The problem with Crazy Ants is they multiply also like crazy. And they leave carcasses, you know, in big quantities everywhere. So this picture of the gentleman kneeling down, that what looks like dirt all over the, um, the step there, those are actually Crazy Ants exoskeletons or, or bodies um, all there. I mean, they just pile up and it can be a real nuisance, these crazy ants, because they leave these large mounds of bodies everywhere. Mosquitoes can also be a, a real problem for us, um, not just because they're irritating when they bite uh, and they can, you know, some people really react badly to them, but also because they can carry diseases. Uh, so we want to be sure that we're looking outdoors and that we're trying to eliminate their, their, the things that they like. So what is it that mosquitoes like? Well, in order for them to complete their life cycle, they need some water. Uh, they lay eggs in water and in the juvenile state, their larval state, uh, they need that water. So we want to make sure, especially this time of year when it's raining, that we are emptying those water sources outside. Um, the one that's very commonly identified with mosquitoes are these old tires left around because they can hold water inside them. Um, very common breeding ground for mosquitoes. But in your landscape, even if you have a well manicured yard, sometimes we have pots and we put little trays under those pots so that it holds water for the plant in the dry time. That can be enough water for mosquitoes to breed in. Um, all they need is a bottle cap full of water to breed. So we want to make sure that we're really eliminating the sources. And if we can't eliminate the source, let's say you have a pond or bromeliads. <laughs> bromeliads can be a huge area for um, mosquitoes to breed. We want to throw some product in there called, uh, it's called BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. And uh, you can buy them in granules, you can buy them in what they call dunks um, to put in your ponds or throw into your bromeliads and it will eliminate those mosquito larvae from being able to breed in there. Okay, with ants, um, I just also want to say with ants, we're looking for ways to 
you know, get rid of them. We don't want to have uh, places that invite them, uh, but we also want to have attractive landscapes, right? So sometimes it becomes a real challenge when we have mulch and leaf litter and, you know, things that make a good environmental landscape to not have these type of pest problems. And sometimes we talk about having that balance of um, wildlife in the yard that can help. Unfortunately, these invasive species like the crazy ants and our fire ants, uh, just there's not really natural predators here for them. So they can overrun the area very quickly. So monitoring these areas um, is, is really important so you don't have a huge problem. Okay, some other common complaints that we find outdoors, um, again, roaches. Uh, roaches are outdoors. Most that's, that's where they like to be. With the exception of the German cockroach, um, most of our roach species want to be outside. They find their way inside, and these American cockroaches, those are the ones that get rather large and come at you when you turn the lights on <laughs> in the middle of the night that freak people out, especially if you're not from Florida and used to it. Um, so uh, they, they really, they have, they have found their way in by accident in most cases, um, and they're, they're not happy indoors, especially in an air-conditioned environment. They don't like that really dry environment. They need some humidity. Um, they need a food source. So if they happen to find their way indoors and then they have food available to them, then you could have an infestation indoors. Um, some things that they really like to eat are cardboard. So, you know, if you have cardboard shoe boxes in your closet or cardboard in your pantry. If you hold on to your Amazon boxes like my son does under the stairs of his apartment, um, they will feast on that and you can have an infestation of them. So keeping, you know, the food sources that they like, you know, gone, uh, cardboard, if you restrain it to maybe one area of the garage if you need to keep it, and then you monitor that area to make sure that you don't get the infestations in there. Uh, but the roaches, they typically don't want to be inside. Uh, they come in sometimes looking for water, um, looking for a dry area if it's super wet outside. Uh, and I, I do want to point out the roach that's zoomed in close. That's actually an Asian cockroach. It looks very much like our German cockroach. And I got to tell you, after we had an infestation of German cockroaches in the house, when I would see these Asian cockroaches outside, I would twitch a little. <laughs> I opened the mailbox one day and there was one in the mailbox and I was like, oh no, here they come again. Um, but it, it was just the Asian. And again, they live outside. Um, they help us actually, they're like a decomposter. So they help break down stuff out in the environment and they can be beneficial outside. Uh, you'll find them in mulch and leaf litter. You'll find them palm trees, especially in those little nooks and crannies um, of where the frond attaches to the tree. You can find them there too. We also have some, what we call occasional invaders. So these guys are, um, they, they want to be outside. Sometimes they make their way indoors and we worry about them being very problematic. And in th these cases, these aren't really problematic for us. They're not going to really harm you. Um, they just are a nuisance indoors. So we have um, the, the centipedes and the earwigs with the little pinchers on them that people get really upset by because they look horrible. They look like they'll, you know, just pick you apart, but they really won't. Um, crickets, blowflies, little roly polies. Um, so a lot of things just kind of make their way in. The roly polies are called pill bugs or sow bugs. Um, you know, different types of flies can make their way inside. We do want to try to take care of the flies because they can spread some diseases, um, you know, because they land on food and often rotting food and then move to food that you're about to eat. So um, you want to you want to try to take care of those flies, prevent them the best you can. Okay, and with that, I've realized that I did not 
explain some of the features of the webinar and maybe some of you are new to webinars. So I'm going to pause for a minute here and just encourage you to mess around with your screen a little bit. You'll have some buttons on your screen. Um, one will say chat and so if you have any questions throughout this presentation, please feel free to enter it in the chat. Um, you're, if, you, if you're having trouble hearing me, if you're having trouble seeing something, um, you don't understand something, let us know. We've got some folks monitoring chat, so we're here to help you with that. Um, if you have a question that's specific to the content, um, then if you would put it in that question and answer or Q&A is what the button says on your screen, you can load that question in there and we will, um, the speaker will answer that question then. So myself or Nellie would be able to answer that question for you. A couple of other things, um, we have your microphones and your cameras turned off so you don't have to worry. Um, they are turned off for our webinar purposes and um, the only way that you would be able to communicate with us is through the chat or the Q&A buttons. And then lastly, you'll, you should see a leave button or an end button. Um, if you want to leave the meeting, uh, that, that's the button that you would hit to end the session. If you'd like to come back, you would just click on the same link that you joined us with originally. So if for some reason you have to leave and you'd like to come back, you can do so right through those buttons. So I apologize I didn't um, share that with you at the beginning. Um, but now you know, and please feel free to chat with us as we're moving throughout this presentation or ask questions. Okay, so let's talk about what this whole integrated pest management stuff is. Um, so we call it IPM uh, for short, Integrated Pest Management, and it really is all about problem solving. Um, it's looking for, you know, what's going on, monitoring, trying to figure out how you can reduce the um, scenarios that are causing the problem and um, and then be more preventative, um, preventing some of these situations instead of having to be reactive. Okay, so. Michelle, we, we have a that's question, I'm sorry. That's Somebody's okay. asking how they get rid of silverfish. Okay, yes. So um, I'm just going to, there we go. Um, silverfish like to chew on paper type of products. So you're going to typically find your silverfish in those papery areas. Um, you're going to want to monitor, of course, um, those areas and, you know, try your best to not have those like uh, dark areas. Now, when you're talking about bookshelves, they can be a problem. Um, they sneak in and I tell you what I'd like to do is we have some fact sheets on silverfish that um, kind of go into detail about that and Nellie if you could just quickly google the EDIS fact sheet on silverfish and put it in the chat the link um, that way folks can have access to that that would be wonderful. If not I'll do it at the end. Um, so Integrated pest management is really about um, using all, all of our resources to try to come up with a solution. Now, I know folks that used to just keep a can of bug spray, you know, on the kitchen counter, and every time they'd see a bug, they would just spray it. Um, that's kind of like just treating a, a, a symptom and not treating the actual problem right? Uh, kind of like if you have a runny nose because you have an infection, if all you do is wipe your nose, you're not treating your infection. You have to get to the root of the problem. Um, so we want to get to the root of the problem and that's how we use um, IPM is trying to figure out what's going on and what's the best way to manage that problem. And by doing that, we can really reduce the amount of chemical that we have to use in our homes and, and in our landscape.
Okay, sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide there. All right, um, so we want to, in this whole process of integrated pest management or IPM, we're wanting to stop pests. Now, can we stop pests entirely? This is Florida. <laughs> we're always gonna have something, right? Um, so sometimes we have to be a little tolerant, uh, but we can we can do a very good job of trying to eliminate and prevent. Uh, but you know, a fly flies into the house when you're coming in with groceries, it, it's hard to eliminate all of that from happening. Uh, but we wanna stop as much as we can. We wanna inspect and monitor for pests. Um, have that critical eye all the time when you're looking at uh, under your kitchen cabinets or in your pantries, um, in the garage, you know, you're going to constantly be looking for signs of pest problems. And I'm going to show you what some of those are. We're going to want to be able to identify the pest because if we can identify the pest, we can identify possibly what it's eating, what's attracting it to the area. Um, and then we need to, to come up with that game plan of what we're going to do to protect the home, protect the landscape. And then we're going to have to monitor and follow up to make sure that our plan is working. Okay, so Nellie was able to put that um, EDIS fact sheet link into the chat. So you can go there to find out more about silverfish. Okay, so when we're talking about IPM, we're, we're coming up with a management strategy in our house. And I have to tell you, um, my main role with the University of Florida is to teach landscape professionals and pesticide applicators uh, these same strategies. Uh, I teach them the same stuff. So your pest control folks, if you are contracting that out, should be using these same types of principles and strategies. And it's something that you should talk with them about. Uh, and when you're trying to find a pest professional to help you with problems that you may have, or you just get um, to the point that you may not want to, to be preventative and looking for uh, ways to prevent these problems, you wanna have some professional help, then when you're interviewing, ask them about integrated pest management. You know, what is their thoughts on it and how do they practice it? Because um, good companies are doing really interesting and inventive things um, in this area and they would definitely have some strategies for, for your home. So again, IPM, it's, it's a whole management system. Um, the first part of that is education, and that's what we're doing today, right? We're here to learn about what pest problems can look like, what we can do to, you know, reduce the problem, prevent the problem, um, eliminate some issues. And then there's, you know, with that comes that cultural or sanitation practices. Uh, we're going to talk about that as we move through the presentation. The, these are things in the in the culture of your home how can you change things in the house to make it less desirable for the pets to want pest not pets <laughs> pests to want to be there what can we eliminate that that water source that food source um, harborage you know places for them to hang out what can we eliminate to make it less desirable for them to be there so hopefully they leave then we've got the physical and mechanical control sometimes we have to actually um, do things like exclusion where we're you know sealing off places to try to keep them out and then there's biological controls um, sometimes we can uh, use nature against itself um, and that's always a good thing uh, so using some biological controls we have more of those available in the outdoor environment really than the indoor environment and then lastly the kind of the last thing we would want to turn to would be the pesticides. And now let me just express that my message is that it is not to not use pesticides. I know that's a double negative, but uh, we know that pesticides are very important and they serve a role and a function and they are necessary in situations. Now I know a lot of people want to not use pesticides at all. Um, I understand that philosophy and your home is your home. But there are certain times that we do need to use a pesticide to get rid of 
an infestation of a pest problem. And sometimes these pests can be problematic for our health even. Um, you know, roaches, they create a lot of fecal matter and all of the interns and researchers that work with roaches end up with allergies to roaches because of that amount of fecal matter that they create. So it can cause allergies and asthma um, for you and your family if you know there's these big roach problems. So definitely we would want to uh, you know eliminate those types of problems. And sometimes it does take a pesticide. But these strategies by using integrated pest management can help reduce the need for that pesticide. So you're going to try to figure out other ways that you can control these problems before you have to reach for that pesticide. And if we do have to reach for a pesticide, we have what we call like the lighter type products. Um, sometimes we can use oils, uh, soaps, things like that, um, that we actually do would consider, you know, a pesticide if we're treating pests with it. So sometimes we can use those or that, like I talked about the um, BT, that's a kind of lighter type of um, of pesticide. And then sometimes we have to go to a, a heavier duty one. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of those out there, um, so we have to be very restrictive on using those. And again, when I'm talking to these pest professionals, we talk to them all the time about not having the kill-all product in their sprayer and using it for every, you know, fly, aphid, bug that they see. Um, and I would encourage that for you as well, you know, having a can of pesticide in the kitchen and just spraying it all the time on everything, that is not a good strategy. Um, not only is it not healthy for you and your family, uh, it's it can create problems where the pest can actually be resistant to that pesticide and you end up spraying a lot of that pesticide uh, with no result and you still have the pest problem. So using these strategies um, can really help the need for the pesticide and also help us with that resistancy issues that we constantly battle out there. All right, so let's talk about exclusion because that's pretty important. Uh, exclusion is how do we keep these boogers out, right? How do we keep the pests out of the home? Um, and there's lots of ways that we do it. The first thing you're going to want to do is walk around your house looking for little cracks and holes. A really popular place is the door jam. Um, that weather stripping can often deteriorate and now you've got, you know, an issue right there at the door that they can walk in just like you. Um, so you want to really look hard. Uh, windows, doors, where pipes come into the house, the roof line where it seals into the house and, um, you know, the the underside of the roof, which is called what? the, the Nellie, if you know, yell it out. I forgot the name of that metal underside of the roof that can help prevent some pests from getting up there too um, on the overhang. So that's something that, again, if you're hiring a pest control company, you want to make sure that they are using these exclusion methods um, and, and helping you with that, helping you to identify how to exclude these pets. Okay, I see two chats here. The soffit, thank you very much, the soffit. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I was looking for, so thank you for that. Okay, um, so not all of the technicians that your pesticide company sends out may be trained to do exclusion. Some of them are trained in other areas. It sometimes takes that very critical eye to be able to do a good job at this. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're getting the right folks that you're asking for that. Some of our pest control companies also um, feel that it takes too much time to do exclusion and they would much rather just treat the problem in your house. Um, so you want to, and this is true of homeowners as well, homeowners and, and con pest control companies, uh, you want to be sure that you're interviewing that pest control company to make sure that this is a standard practice for them. Um, you want to get a good company. 
Michelle, something that I suggest here is that you mentioned the times that uh, the, this company is going to do visits to the house because not all offer the same time. Right, so the different companies offer different services. Nelly, is that the point that you're making and not all the companies um, are well suited to, to do this? I'm trying to get to the comment you were making. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Okay, okay. Um, Nelly, are you wanting to take over anywhere? You let me know. Okay, so as a homeowner, you are the best person to not only advocate for your home, but to be super involved with the prevention of pests in your home. And why is that? Uh, well, you're highly motivated. <laughs> you live there. <laughs> it's your issues, right? And it's the um, things that you have to be annoyed with in your house or can cause damage to your home or your investment. So you are highly motivated to find a solution. Um, not only that, you're around it. You see it you can take the time and figure out where the ants are coming in at and follow them back to their nest to try to, um, you know, eliminate those issues. Exclusion, again, it does take time, but, you know, you live there. So checking your windows, just maybe as you're cleaning your windows or cleaning your windowsill, do that check around the window, look for the seal. I actually had ghost ants in my office this week and we had a, a big rainstorm and um, had a, a whole little pack of ghost ants that came in and I found that they were coming in through the windowsill. Um, some dirt had built up underneath the windowsill or underneath the window jam, you know, where the window connects into the frame and some dirt had built up and it caused the window to not go down enough that the ants were able to come right through there. But, you know, this is my office and I was sitting there and watching and trying to figure out what was going on and where they were coming from. And I had time and fortunately it's in the air conditioning <laughs> that I could do that. But some, um, some, not all, we have some really good pest control companies out there, but some pest control companies that may not be as motivated, um, you know, they wouldn't take the time to follow the ants back and see where they're coming from. Um, so we want to, again, be really good about interviewing our companies, making sure that they take the steps to do that instead of just coming in and spraying um, the ant situation that we have. Because again, that's just treating a symptom. It's not really treating the problem. Uh, so exclusion, you know, it, it deals with looking around the home, looking up at the roof, looking pipes, you know, all kinds of places for those pests to come in. But exclusion also can have a lot to do with what's going on out in this landscape. So if this was your house, um, I want you to go ahead and type in the chat what you think um, you could do maybe differently to help with pest problems in this landscape. So if you would go ahead and chat with me some things that might be done differently around this house. I'm going to give just a minute. We've got some saying that the plants are too close to the home. And that I agree with. So yes, if you've got plants that are touching your house like that, or especially, you know, coming up onto the roof, it looks like next to the window, there might be a vine that's coming up onto the side of the house. Um, that makes a great bridge for those pests to come in. Um, you can have pest problems by having those opportunities for the pest to climb up the, the plants and come right in. Um, so having a little bit of clear space between your home and your plants is a good idea um, for, for pests especially. Um, 
but for other reasons too. It helps you to maintain your home easier too if you keep that clear space, but it's especially important for pests. So we really, we recommend uh, leaving about two feet from the base of your home, the foundation of your home, out to where your plants start. Plants hold moisture. They have to have moisture to survive, and so they're going to hold moisture in that area, and moisture is another one of those things that can bring pests in, so you want to be sure that you're not encouraging pests with that moisture. Okay. So some more things that you can do to prevent pests. Um, when we go to the grocery store or especially the pet store to buy pet food, you want to be inspecting those items before you bring them into your home. Remember my story about the roaches? Uh, I did not heed that advice and we did not inspect that piece of equipment <laughs> very well and we're quite sure that that's how we got the roast infestation. <laughs> um, so definitely inspect items coming in. And it's not just from the grocery or the pet food store. Um, pet food is one of the common ones that insects come in on. Um, but it's also if you shop at thrift shops, you'll want to definitely, you know, Goodwill, thrift stores, picking up interesting stuff on the side of the road. And I'm not discouraging you from doing these things. It's a great way to recycle, right? Um, However, you just want to inspect the items before you bring them into your house because you could be bringing in bed bugs. The reason that bed frame is on the side of the road could be because they had bed bugs and they were just fed up and took it all to the road. So, um, you know, inspect things really well before you bring them into your house, especially um, from the grocery store, you know, your cardboard items, you know, make sure that as you're grabbing them from the store shelf, even that you're inspecting them, looking for little chews, chew marks, um, things like that. So German cockroaches, again, really bad problem. Um, if they get established in the house, it, it does take a little bit for you to get rid of them. Uh, so you wanna prevent that as much as you can. Uh, they commonly come in in cardboard or paper bags. Um, those, you know, I use, I ask for paper bags at the grocery store if I forget my reusable bags because, you know, we're all trying to reduce our one use plastics, right? Um, but we have to be careful with those paper bags that we're not bringing in some pests because that can be really common. Those paper bags are stored at the grocery store where there's a lot of food and other items that can be um, sitting there, you know, for the the pest to have a good infestation in the store um, and then they get into those bags. So you just want to be careful with your bags that you're not bringing some some pests in. So um, insects are really good at multiplying. That's their, you know, function <laughs> is to, to breed and multiply. So they're really good at it. And roaches, um, mosquitoes, flies, they can they can lay, you know, hundreds of eggs in their lifetime. So um, very quickly you can have an infestation. So you'll want to always, always be monitoring, looking for things, uh, signs and symptoms of a pest problem. So let's talk about that exclusion again. Um, you want to make sure that you're sealing the building we're, we call it the building envelope, you know, the outside perimeters and sides and roof of your house. Um, you'll want to keep outdoor pests outdoors. <laughs> um, so we want to keep them outside and not have ways for them to come inside. So let's look at how we can do that. If you take a quarter and turn it on its side, just like in the photo, that quarter on its side. That's as much space as is needed for a lot of our pests to be able to come in. So um, a American cockroach only needs that thickness to be able to enter the home. Sometimes we will talk about in terms of a credit card too, the side of a credit card. If you can slide that in, it's easier sometimes to use a credit card uh, in door jams than a quarter because it's hard to hold it when you slide it in. Um, but if you can slide in a credit card or a quarter, then an American cockroach would be able to come into that house. 
or if you can see light if you're looking at your door to the outside and you know you kind of shut off all your lights in the house if you can see light around the edge of that door that's how many of your pests are going to be entering the house so this is a commercial building and this um, photo with the double doors and you can see I'm hoping you can see my mouse. there you go you can see my mouse right there um, that crack that is a huge crack all kinds of pests can be coming in this door um, all kinds of bugs and insects uh, can come in there so we would want to do something to seal that get some weather stripping um, get some kind of a sweep on the edge of that door another really great thing to do is install one of these door sweeps on your door um, that bottom um, area right there it's really common for the weather stripping to get worn out from you know walking through that area or rolling things over that area so installing one of these door sweeps on the door itself um, can help keep that area sealed door sweeps cost as little as ten dollars at uh, you know our, our box stores and um, you can grab one and put it on it it's very helpful okay screens another great way to um, keep those bugs out you want to make sure that your screens are in good repair uh, you can see the one here is going to let the mosquitoes and the flies right in because it's got too big of openings um, so that's not going to be very helpful the other thing is those screens they often um, the metal frames on your screens can bend from you pulling them in and out by cleaning your windows um, so sometimes you actually have a bend in that metal and the pests are able to you know just come right around that so you want to make sure that your screens are in, in very good repair weather stripping uh, and caulk sealant um, another great way to help exclude those pests keeping them from coming in um, the other bonus to this is it can help save energy for you too by eliminating the hot air coming in in the summer um, and the and the uh, cold air from coming in in the winter so it can really help you with your energy costs as well if you can see light around your doors or your windows you'll want to you know look for a way to weather strip or seal somehow um, you know put the sweeps on something to keep those pests out okay so again um, size of a quarter the edge of a quarter that's all they need to come in so you want to make sure that you're um, looking for any light that is is that you know just that small of an area um, but you'll also want to be sure that when you're weather stripping um, that you're using a good kind of weather stripping sometimes um, unfortunately the weather stripping or the you know rubber type strips some pests actually enjoy the taste of um, so you'll want to make sure that you're you know getting a, a good one um, that it's not something that the pest will eat through and come in anyway just make sure you know once you've got your weather stripping in place that you know you shut the door and that it it's effective um, sometimes weather stripping can be very thick and it can make it so your door doesn't actually seal properly so if you get you know the wrong thickness if it's too thick sometimes that can actually create a bigger gap or or a gap that wasn't there before so make sure that you're following up once you install different pipes coming in and out of your house can have different issues um, this is a kind of an air vent pipe you can find things like your dryer vents um, coming out like this and that's a great place for pests to come in in this case uh, they've put just the metal um, the metal screen on and that's really more of a rodent control uh, to keep the the rats and mice from getting in there um, you could screen it however you need to be very careful with that because your screen can if if this is a dryer vent the screen can get lint 
built up on it. And then you could have a bigger problem with, you know, fires and all. So um, if you do some kind of screening, it's going to need to be something you can clean out that you can, you know, regularly check. At my house, we have one that it's a square and it's got little like louvers in it. And when the dryer is running, the air behind it causes the little louvers to open. And when the dryer is not running, the little louvers close back again. So um, that's a, a pretty good little way to keep it closed off from insects and rodents and all when the dryer is not running. And then when it's running, the air is blowing out and they really wouldn't be able to get in. Uh, another area, especially for ants, that you'll want to watch is around your uh, water spigot. So where your water spigot is outside, you know, over time use, moving back and forth, sometimes in your stucco, it can, there can be a little opening and the ants can come into the home that way. They get into the walls um, and then, you know, find a way in once they're in the walls. So sealing around those water spigots can also be really helpful. You want to keep those shrubs and, and as we pointed out earlier, keep those shrubs pruned away from the building, keep vegetation pruned away from the building um, because we can actually create bridges, we can create harborage right there for the pests and then they have that avenue to come in and out of the home. So keep keep your shrubs and your trees and all off of the building. Now I'm not saying don't have any shrubs and I'm not saying don't have any trees, um, but just keep them from touching your building. And our recommendation is really to keep them two feet away from the foundation of the home. That's um, again for moisture and having a little clear space. Okay, I'm going to take a little moment here and do a little poll. So I'm going to launch a poll and when I do it's going to come up on your um, it's going to come up on your screen and you should be able to either touch the answers or just click with your mouse on the answer. So I'm going to launch the poll now. There's just two questions. Um, so if you would answer those questions for me I would really appreciate it. We'll take just a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. All right, so good job. Everyone got it that when there is a space the size of a quarter, on its side, um, bugs like roaches can get in, so good. And the best way to treat pest problems is preventing them from entering and establishing. So good job. Okay, we're gonna move to the next slide. So some of the problem is us. <laughs> Sometimes we're the problem out there. Um, banana boxes, which is shown in this picture here, used to be, and I think still are, um, very commonly known as great sturdy heavy boxes to use for moving. Um, teachers a lot of times use them because they are a heavy box. Uh, they're all uniform in size. You can grab them at the grocery store, behind the grocery store, and um, you know, stack up your stuff in them. They can be very organized, uh, but they're cardboard and they can harbor a bunch of pests. So we would not recommend using banana boxes as a way to store, um, you know, even just cardboard. If you're going to be storing stuff for a while, uh, cardboard's not the best option. Um, try to get some, some kind of a tote 
that's not made out of cardboard um, so that you're not harboring those pest problems. Schools can be a, this is taken from a school, schools can be a, a real problem because of the cardboard storage and, um, you know, food here, there, and everywhere. Uh, also clutter, um, and that's the next photo here. And I know nobody on here has a home that looks like this, but this is a real photo. Uh, there are times that, you know, our pest control operators are walking into these types of situations. Um, and so how could you even treat that problem? You know, how can you even get the, the application to where it needs to go when you have that much clutter and food and everything? So, um, you know, sometimes it's really us that create these issues. Um, sorry. I doing a little mouse thing here. All right. There we go. Okay. So decluttering. Um, if you were coming in and you had a pest problem and you were looking at these two different scenarios, which space would be easier for you to look and see where the problem actually is, where it can be coming from? Um, so go ahead and chat with me which would be your ideal <laughs> scenario? <laughs> so I'm looking at this picture here and I'm wondering what this is. <laughs> Um, it could be air freshener, but it also could be pesticide that they need because they have these uh, yummy donuts <laughs> being stored here. Um, so yeah, this is a yoga studio off. Um, so yeah, coming in here and trying to figure out what the problems are, you know, where the pests are would be very easy versus coming over into this situation where, you know, you have ants that are coming at, onto your desk, let's say, and who knows where they're coming from. It would be very difficult to look and see exactly where the ants are coming from in this scenario. So cleaning it up, straightening it up, um, removing a lot of this paper product and all these books and everything back here where pests just would love to be hanging out. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about that harborage. Um, that's, that's where they would be. So, um, again, a lot of the issues we create ourselves. So we just need to take the extra step to kind of clean up. And when we bring those groceries in, we want to make sure that we're um, inspecting them before we put them away. Okay. So if you live in an apartment or a condo and you do have a pest control service or if you live, you know, in your home um, and you have a pest control service, if you see something, you need to say something, okay? You need to report the pest problems because oftentimes they're coming in, they're walking around, they're looking, but they're, they're you know, on site for a short period of time and they don't see everything. So they rely on you telling them that there's a problem. Um, in this case, if you have a pest control service, you don't have to be the one identifying what the problem is, uh, what the pest is, because you can, um, you know, show them. But if you need help, if, you know, as a homeowner, you want to deal with the pest problem and you don't know what that particular pest is in your house, guess what? We have a free service that can help you. And our county extension offices um, can definitely help you with this. We have highly trained uh, master gardeners in our office that man a help desk um, that you can come in. Unfortunately, right now we are still close to the public, but we will be opening um, soon. We're, we're anticipating. Um, in the meantime, we are identifying problems via photos sent to us on email. Um, so a lot of photo ideas is happening these days, uh, but we are a free resource for you. 
And so if we can't identify what the problem is, then we have researchers and specialists like Faith Oy, who I mentioned, that we would send the photos to um, that they can help us with that. And, and it's always good to do that because sometimes we find a new pest problem here in Florida that we didn't have before. Um, so we always want to identify for many reasons. Um, one, to you know make sure we don't have some new bugaboo in Florida, but also to know how to treat that issue. You know, if you you know know it's an ant versus a termite, those two can be very difficult, challenging to tell the difference between. Um, you're going to treat those two situations entirely different, uh, ants versus termites. So the exclusion part may be similar, um, but when you have the problem treating it, it's going to be entirely different. So you need to know what you're dealing with so you know how to treat it. Sometimes we can't find the pest itself. All we can find is maybe some frass or some droppings of some kind, some damage, chewing, gnawing. Um, so sometimes we can identify from that. Like termites, for instance, have very unique droppings. Um, if you brought me termite droppings in, I could tell you very quickly that that's what that was. Um, so you know, just because you don't have the pest itself doesn't mean that we can't help you identify it. So we can help here at the extension. We're a free service. And then also your pest control operators can help. Okay, I see that there's a couple of chats here. Let me just check. Okay, so Nellie, thank you. She's um, put in our Facebook page um, that you can find more information about our services there. Okay, so when it comes to droppings, um, droppings tell us stuff. This is uh, the German cockroach funness here. <laughs> um, so we've got some German cockroaches. They really like to be around electrical stuff. They like that hum and the warmth and all. Uh, so German cockroaches, they also can have a very distinctive smell. And I know that's not appealing, um, but they can have a very distinctive smell. And I know Faith um, and, and one of our um, Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services inspector, uh, Paul Matola, they've told me many times that they've walked into restaurants, smelled that smell, and turned around and walked back out. <laughs> so it's a very distinctive smell. Um, once you smell it, you know it. But we can find their droppings. Um, you can see it's like this dirty, uh, you know, it looks like maybe rust has fallen. Um, if you're under your sink and you see this kind of stuff, you'll want to investigate further. Uh, sometimes it can be just be some ero uh, corrosion on your pipes that's falling down onto the, ca the cabinet below, um, but sometimes it could be roach. And so you wanna investigate that a little bit further. Over here, these little droplets, Anybody know what those are a result of? This looks like it's up in the attic on maybe an air duct. Anybody wanna share what they think is going on in that one? Eggs we've got and rodent, yep. Yes, so definitely this, um, it, it could be eggs, maybe, um, but up in the attic, if you know where your you kind of like your problem children are, <laughs> uh, up in the attic, we're probably, if you find this, you're going to be looking for some type of a rodent. Um, you know, rats um, typically leave these kind of droppings in the scattered pattern like this from them running back and forth. They typically kind of have a pattern that they use to come in. Um, Typically, they're coming in and it's their harborage. They go back out at night. and If there's not any food or water sources, um, they just use your attic sometimes as a harborage space. Then this photo down here, um, this is droppings. Any idea from what these droppings could be from? This one is something unique, not droppings. 
However, notice how similar it looks to droppings. Any ideas on that one? Okay, little mouse issue there. I'm having mouse issues today and not the rodent mouse. <laughs> okay, so actually when we're looking, so we, we see that this is a leaf, but I see this, um, we have a light outside our door and I see this very commonly around um, the ground where the light is. And these are droppings. It could be uh, frog, but most likely lizard. Uh, lizard droppings, frog droppings can be similar sometimes, but uh, like lizard droppings, if you were to crush them and look, they're full of little insect pieces and parts. But this is actually the larva of a swallowtail butterfly. And it looks very similar um, to this, or sometimes people will say it looks like bird poop. Um, so interesting to note, because if you happen to see one of these little guys, you know that um, you've got a little butterfly there. So always identify, 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 right? Before we treat especially. We... Okay, so evidence of pest problems. You know, we've talked a lot about paper bags and cardboard, and here's what it looks like. So if you've got some roaches and, you know, a little roach infestation, um, you're going to see some droppings left over from them. Um, so it's going to look, you know, like this. So if you see this, you've got a problem and you need to start clearing out your cardboard. <laughs> Some other things that you might see are um, webbing. Uh, you might notice when you're going through your groceries uh, that you find, you know, in, in rice sometimes, uh, you'll find like this webbing or in some of your cereals and all. Um, so we call those pantry pests um, or you'll, you'll actually find the pests themselves in there. There are little weevils. You can see this little weevil guy here um, that can get into these products. And uh, <laughs> some people just, you know, deal with them, pull them out of the rice when they're cooking it. <laughs> they see a little brown piece of rice and they pull it out because, uh, but sometimes it's weevils. So we want to just be sure we're not bringing the problems home. We want to be checking our products as uh, we bring them in to make sure that this isn't happening. And one of the ways to do that is to transfer it into a container. Um, again, I share my experience with German cockroaches. It was horrible and we changed our whole way of life of how we do things in our house. Um, we do not have any cardboard boxes in our pantry. We take everything as soon as we get it from the grocery store now and put it into a plastic bin. Any rice, pasta, cereal, um, even tea, you know, tea comes in cardboard boxes. It all goes into uh, sealing, you know, airtight type of containers um, in the pantry, just because that was a real headache to deal with at the time. Also gnawing, you know, this is a sign of rodents, of course, um, but if you see any gnawing marks around, uh, you definitely want to say something, um, you know, or, or start program, you know, come up with some strategies for your home. It could be mice or, uh, you know, rats causing a problem. And looking at um, dog food, some people store dog food in their garage um, and the bag will be nibbled, gnawed at the corner and uh, you'll find some dog food actually coming out of it where they've gotten into it and pulled it out. Um, so, you know, constant monitoring is a big, a big part of this pest prevention or, or pest monitoring, pest prevention, pest control. Uh, we're, again, constantly looking whenever we're cleaning, vacuuming, uh, in the garage. You know, if you see something strange, you want to you wanna say something or, or come up with a strategy to deal with it. So this picture is showing, let me get on. The slide here. This picture is showing um, 
what we call rub marks. So when rats travel, they typically will travel on pipes like such, and when they do, they leave kind of like this grease mark um, where they go. So when you see, you know, especially in on pipes or on wood beams um, in the attic, when you see this kind of look to it, you'll want to investigate further. I would start looking for droppings, um, start looking for chew marks, and see if that's the issue. Um, but a lot of times when you see this, you've got a rodent issue. Okay. Um, so this was a, what we call a sticky trap. And, and part of monitoring is sometimes setting up some, some sticky traps. Um, you can get some sticky traps for under your sinks, in your cabinets, and it's just a way to monitor to see if you have any pest problems. So you set up your sticky traps and you check them occasionally. And if you see roaches on them, number one, you take that sticky trap and discard it and get a new one and know that you need to start treating for roaches, right? You need to put out some baits. Um, it's looking for eliminating the water sources, the food sources. Do you have a drippy sink? Are the roaches coming in and taking advantage of the water from the drippy sink? Drippy pipe under the sink. You know, eliminate that. Eliminate any food. Um, put out some baits. But the the monitoring, the sticky traps are to monitor. And in this case, this is a big sticky trap. This is a rodent sticky trap. And, and often we use these when we know we have a problem. Well, there was a problem. That is the skeletal remains of a rodent. Um, but look, nobody came and monitored the sticky trap and now it's no longer useful. Plus, now it's become an attraction for other insects, right? Now we've got flies and beetles and all kinds of pests that can come and eat the carcass of this decaying rodent. So um, if you're going to put out this, the monitoring stations or any kind of sticky trap, you're going to need to maintain it. Um, set it up on your calendar. I love my phone calendar. It lets me do reminders. <laughs> and those are the kinds of things I put in there so that, you know, on the day it's time for me to check it, it comes up on my phone and I know I have to go check on things. All right, so in this photo, um, we've got some bird's nests going on. <laughs> and this little wiry stuff is often used to keep birds away, right? Well, look, they just used it to create their nest, a <laughs> structure for their nest. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, cleaning out these areas. If you have that bird's nest up there, uh, you know, I'm an environmentalist, of course, if there's eggs or little baby birds in there, you could, you know, just wait a little bit. But um, once the birds have left the nest, by all means, get that nest out of there because that nesting is going to provide harborage for insects. So you'll want to, you know, keep those kinds of areas cleared out. And this a lovely picture, our lovely pictures. <laughs> so we go to pest school over in Orlando. Um, I get to go to learn about, you know, new pest problems that we have. And we also teach our pest controllers at the school. And one of the activities that we do is we try to find the best place to put these sticky traps out. And it's in, a, in the lab there at the school. So we find these places. And the first time I went, um, my group found a great place, you know, we put our sticky trap out and the next day we came back and it looked like this. And we thought, oh my goodness, this building has a huge problem. <laughs> but they actually baited it. They actually put the bugs on it while we were gone. <laughs> um, but <laughs> this just, it, it reminds me of that, that uh, class that I took a little flashback. Um, but these are sticky traps. So what you would do is um, put these sticky traps out. Oh, sorry about that. We would date them. You know, I write the date on them that I put them out so that, um, you know, occasionally you just need to refresh them because they get dust in them. And hopefully that's all you're catching is just dust. Um, 
my computer is still, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, hopefully you just catch dust and you have to refresh them because the dust creates a layer on your uh, stickiness here um, and it no longer allows insects to really stick on there. But you would put these like under your cabinet, uh, close to where your pipes are, um, in the backs of your drawers in your kitchen, uh, maybe in the bathroom under cabinets, um, you know, places where you might commonly find some of these insects. And these are just little monitoring stations. Um, so you'll wanna check them, you know, regularly, monthly is how often I check them. And when you do have the pest problem, then you're gonna develop that strategy um, to come up, you know, with how to treat these pests now. Um, so hopefully you don't ever have them looking like this. Uh, these are multiple problems. Um, you can see there's, in, in this case, it's the outdoor cockroach um, that's come in. And so, you know, what are we gonna do in that case? We have a, a pest that really wants to be, or an insect that really wants to be outside, and now he's come inside. So, chat me and tell me what you think we should do about that. Where should we look and what should, how should we approach it? So I see some folks chatting in. Thank you. So yes, yeah, looking for um, any food sources, eliminating that, looking for any water sources, eliminating that, and looking for how they got in. You know, that size, uh, the side of a quarter or a credit card, you know, looking for openings that big. And, and that's how they probably got in and eliminating those openings. So that's the kind of management strategy that we would come up with if this is what we saw in our, in our sticky trap. We could set some baits out if we know we now have a problem. We have all different sizes here, um, different uh, life cycle stages. So from the little guys to the big guys. So we probably do have an infestation inside. Uh, we're gonna need to find what they're feasting on, <laughs> need to find what their water source is, eliminate those things. Um, but we can set some bait out for the ones that we, you know, have indoors. Um, there are some very good bait products. And we like baits because baits are very specific to the insect. Uh, a lot of times when we're spraying, you know, just an insect spray, it's killing everything and it can be, you know, leaving residues and things like that. So we want to try to come up with a product that is more specific to the insect that we're trying to kill versus one, especially outdoors, that can maybe harm your bees and your butterflies and your pollinators um, or, or even other things. So um, baits are, you know, typically a very good choice when it comes to insect control. Okay, down here, the, these are mostly the German cockroaches. There's a, looks like a woodsy one that looks like he kind of found his way in, flew into the light when you open the door or something. They really don't like to be inside those woodsy cockroaches. Um, so, if you have this German cockroach situation, now this is a different story. German cockroaches are an indoor roach. They actually like it in the dry scenario. They like it in that, you know, electrical, warm kind of um, scenario there. What are we gonna do? What do we do if we open up our monitoring station and find this? So go ahead and share in the chat what you think you might do. Okay, so with these German roaches, again, you're going to want to find, you know, try to find what their 
um, eating, they can go a very long time without water. So water typically isn't going to be something that you're going to eliminate and make a dent on these guys. With German cockroaches, the more important issue is the harborage, um, finding out where they're, you know, made their home. And it can be challenging. Sometimes it's behind your um, electric outlets, uh, up in the lights, fixtures in your home. Um, they like that electrical stuff. And in our case, it was in the dishwasher um, insulation. So when we pulled out the dishwasher, we found them and it was not a pretty sight. <laughs> um, but that's where they were, that whole insulation around the outside of the dishwasher in that cabinet perfect environment for them. Warm, um, that electrical, you know, dark, everything. So that dishwasher went straight to the curb when we found that. Um, so with this situation, um, trying to find harborage is going to be really important, but in this case you're going to need to bait. That's, you know, they're indoors, they've established, and you're going to need to bait to get rid of them. And you're going to have to be vigilant about, you know, continuing to freshen your bait, um, put it in various locations, and continue to monitor until you, you know, are no longer getting them in your sticky traps. Okay, so again, IPM. It stands for integrated pest management, but sometimes it's integrated people management because we have to, you know, declutter, store things appropriately, monitor. Um, so, you know, it's, it's this strategy, this um, tool that we have, well, many tools that we have in a toolbox to help us take care of these pest problems. So with that, I want to invite Nellie to come back.